G'day, I'm Dean. We're here at my farm Hinatai Hops in the Tasman District, New Zealand. We're here this morning with Dr. Ron Beetson, who is a brand ambassador for NZ Hops and the former principal scientist at Plant and Food Research. Fiora Dean. And also Colin Oldham, who's another NZ Hops master grower who has two farms nearby, New Hoplands and New Hoplands North. Hi. Nectaron is, um, it was developed in, initially from across in 2004 and it was released in 2020. It's, it's, it's sort of a win-win really, it's a good grower hop and also a um, good brewer's selection. What about you Colin, you grow it at both your farms, what's your experience with Nectaron so far? Well we're harvesting um, first year Nectaron today and the aromas coming out of the shed is just booming. Yeah, it's got unique tropical aromas. I mean, if you want to make a really good IPA and Pilsner or Pale Ale, this is a hop. I don't think there's been, ever been a beer that's been brewed with it where people are not really taken with the flavours of it. It's just outstanding, I think. Well, we've had a great growing season. I mean, the crop is in great condition. We haven't had any real stresses from the weather. We're optimistic it's going to be an above average year for, uh, in terms of the, the quality of the Nectaron. So we're looking forward to a really good harvest. And Nectaron, you know, our, our whole germoplasm from New Zealand that Ron works with is unique. You know, our tyranny of distance makes it unique and, and pretty special. This year we're growing significant volumes of Nectaron for you to get hold of. And it's only grown by New Zealand master growers in New Zealand. I think, I think Nectaron's a great name, you know, it's a, it's a nod to the, the, the booming flavour that it is and also to Ron, you know, we're, we're super proud of Ron, he's done such an amazing job. Well, if you're looking for an amazing aroma and that too, for the brewers, this is the hop for you. All right, um, welcome everyone, thank you for joining us today on our webinar on Nectaron. Uh, we have a, a, a good hour planned for everyone today informational, let you know what Nectron's all about and, and while it goes. Um, my name is Matt Johnson. I am the commercial hop strategist here at BSG. I work exclusively with our hop and our hop program. Um, and I'm here to give you a little guide through uh, meeting Dr. Ron and Dean and talking about Nectron today. So first of all, New Zealand Hops Limited um, has supported a professional plant breeding program since the 1950s. And in 1972, New Zealand became the first country in the world to commercially produce hops from triploid hop cultivars in response to international brewers' demand for seedless hops. During the last decade, the breeding program of new hop cultivars has focused on the development of quality aromatic hops utilizing traditional European noble hop cultivars for selected development. New Zealand Hop Limited is able to offer a range of hops with interesting aromatic properties, providing the brewer with the dual benefits of both a pleasant aroma and an economic bittering. Most notable, those would be like Nelson and Motoic, and I'm sure uh, most everyone is, is familiar with those. Uh, New Zealand Hops Limited and BSG has had a partnership for over uh, 13 years now, and we are your exclusive source, source for Nectaron. So now I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Ron Beetson, New Zealand Hops brand ambassador and research scientist and curator and namesake of Nectaron, and also Dean Palmer, owner and operator of the award-winning Henny Thai Hop out of New Zealand. Welcome, gentlemen. Well, thanks very much. Hey, Ron, do, do we have your camera on? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, hey, we, hey, good we, to we see you. There. <laughs> Good to Sorry see you. Sorry about that. everyone. I, yeah, yeah. And I know Dean's Thank, there somewhere. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. There you go. Hi, Dean. Um, thank you for both of you joining us today. Uh, and good morning down in New Zealand. Um, so let's get started. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, how long you've been in the hop industry, how you got started, uh, what you like most about it. And I think we'll start with Dr. Ron. So give us a little background of how long you've been in the hop industry. Uh, well, I've actually been a research scientist in hops uh, since uh, the early 1980s, actually. So uh, I finished my PhD, uh, which I completed in the United States. And on the way back to New Zealand, they informed me that I was going to uh, take over the hop breeding program in New Zealand. So I um, took the opportunity to 
visit the Pacific Northwest. So that was in 82, in fact. And so I spent about uh, on a, th a few weeks up there talking to all the researchers and getting gaining a lot of knowledge. Of course, the, uh, the gurus of, of hop uh, breeding up there at the time. And uh, certainly um, I learned a huge amount of, uh, it came back with a lot of information for the, the start of the program that I was um, you know, it was already in place here, but um, so that was early 80s. I became the, the project leader in 1984 and uh, I relinquished that post and um, I retired in 2000, end of 2021. So that's a potted history. I've I've been born and raised in this area um, and uh, so hops are in my blood, so to speak. <clears throat> and um, I have worked in other crops as well, but um, hops has been the, my... Um, labor of love, if you like. So. No, that's great. That's great. And Dean, how about you? Tell us a little bit how long you've been uh, in the hop industry in, in New Zealand. Yeah, well, I've been um, on, on the farm where I'm currently for uh, 16 years now, but my family has uh, has a long history of hop growing. We, we've grown hops here not long after my family arrived from England in, in 1843, and we were growing hops in the, in the 1850s at our home farm in Waimea West. Um, and our family continued growing hops until my dad decided that he wanted out of hops and we took a 30 year break before um, then investing in a, in a new farm that I work on currently in, in Tapuera and I worked there as a kid and then and went away and, and travelled and, and worked as an engineer and then came back to the farm and I've I've been there yeah, for 16 years and have seen the sort of um, the commodity boom of 09 and then the emergence of the craft industry and you know emergence of a lot of our our new varieties and now um i you know i'm on the farm quite regularly and i also uh you know i um at new zealand hops i'm a director and i i chair the research committee and i work on the grower committee there as well so i have quite a lot of input to um you know new zealand hops particularly the grower network there wow great seems well connected there um 1850 is quite a long time. Um, it's good to hear. Now I got to ask this question. It's kind of a fun question. Um, of the two, do you prefer Pilsner or IPA? <laughs> IPA, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm IPA, and uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, it might, it might upset some of the purists, but I'm, I'm a real hazy, hazy fan. Um, I share a lot of beers with my with my wife these days. Often, uh, you know, if a bigger can split between two to to sample something, and you know, she's a, she's a well, not a recent convert, but definitely a convert, and and really keen on on hazies. So we are we're, we're pretty into those at the moment down here. That's great. That's great. Um, seems seems that that I picked the right one. IPA is usually uh, a lot of the hop growers' favorites. Um, so let's get into the breeding and development of Nectaron here. I'm going to ask both of you this question separately, and I think I'll start with, with Dr. Ron. Tell us the story of Nectaron um, from a breeder's perspective, how, how you got to, to cultivate this and, and how it got to be the great hop that it is today. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll answer it as, as, uh, in, as briefly as I can, but um, the it it was... Nectaron was born, if you like, in uh, in January 2004, to give you an idea of the length of time, and it was released in 2020. So it had a 16-year um, development phase. Um, the program here in New Zealand is, um, as we've discussed, it's been a, a triploid breeding program. So, uh, and, and Nectaron's a triploid. And so basically, um, we've been having this program since the 1960s, and uh, we've developed a lot of genetic material here in New Zealand, um, which has got both uh, European ancestry and also North American ancestry. And that's highlighted in the development of uh, Nectaron. It's got some good genes from both of those um, natural areas where hops grow. Um, so the cross was made and it was developed, it was selected in 2006. And we took it through to um, larger scale trials. We realized pretty early on that it had something pretty special about it. Um, it did have a sister, actually. Um, its sister is the cultivar Waimea. 
Now, Waimea was fast-tracked at that time. Um, the research committee that um, I was part of, um, they felt like they wanted another high alpha hop, which was, as you can appreciate, you know, right back in the early 2000s, it was um, alpha was still um, very, very important in, um, in our breeding program. So that one was released. It was fast-tracked and was released in 2012. So Waimea is its full system. And um, but in the background, I, I always uh, I thought this selection had some really good agronomic uh, performance uh, attributes and also had some wonderful flavors and the chemistry looked pretty good. Um, we hadn't actually surprisingly, we hadn't done a lot of brewing up until um, the early around about 2013, 14. But at that time, we um, we had an investment um, money from um, the New Zealand government and uh, uh, funding program in conjunction with the uh, New Zealand hops and we invested in a little pilot brewing plant at that time and it was um it was it was built by a local engineer and uh, it was a it was a really it's a neat little kit we still got it functioning today and it's a 50 liter kit and um it sort of looks like a commercial brewing <laughs> Um, operation but just on a mini scale and this guy's um, the guy that built the brewing kit has got um, he's built craft brewing uh, uh, breweries around Australasia and, and into the Pacific and other places so he's, he knew what he's doing anyway so the kit was um, put into action in 2014 and um, hey presto one of the first hops we tried through it was uh, what became Nectaron and it stood out and everybody um, liked it. So we thought, oh, well, we better do another brew with that. So we did another brew and uh, it still uh, showed a lot of promise. And so at that stage, it was um, propagated up and went out onto a grower property. Um, and about that time also too, it became, it was pushed out to brewers and put into uh, several different um, New Zealand breweries at that stage. Um, and uh, the, it, it was I haven't heard of anybody who doesn't like it so um, it, it's one of those hops that sort of stands out it's a big punchy hop uh, got lots of uh, tropical flavors and aromas and that was what we're after the program here is we focused heavily on breeding hops for um, for flavor and aroma um, we don't have any pest and diseases to speak of so we don't have to um, uh, select all our program uh, our programs not oriented around pest and diseases because there aren't any to speak of um, and so we've been able to concentrate on flavor and, and also good agronomics and by 2020 it, it, it was pretty obvious it was um, going to be a commercial success so we uh, by that stage lots of people were wanting to get their hands on it and it had a code number uh, 4337 at that stage and then it became um, Nectron so that was when it was named in 2020. So that's the that's a short history of it. Um, I'm I'm very proud of it. Uh, it's one of the standout hops. Uh, they don't come along very often in a in a plant breeder's career of you know of standout hops, but Nelson Sovin and and um, Nectron probably be the two that stood have stood out for me uh, personally as um, hops that I I'm very proud to have been part of in the breeding program. Of course, uh, behind me is a lot of people working at plant and food research at uh, here and uh, not too far out of Motueka, the hometown here of. Where I live, and it's um, there's a little regional research centre which works on a number of crops, and one of them is hops. And I've got a team, or had a team there up until the end of 2021, and uh, it's been it's now run by um, Kerry Templeton, who's um, got some. He's he's more brewer oriented than what I've ever been, and uh, so he's he's taken the program over and, and is taking it uh, taking it on in the future for or um, developing new selections with uh, lots and lots of flavor. Great. Um, I do have a question for you. Since you spent so much time working with Hort 4337 or Nectaron, um, how does it feel to see the top succeed in the way it has? Oh, del I'm delighted. <laughs> it's... Uh... Yeah, I know. I'm very proud of it. And um, Dean will attest to that. I've been out on his farm um, helping him with the fresh hop harvest of Nectaron the last two years. And uh, it's, um, it's, it's great. I, I love going out to the farms. Uh, it's been one of, one, of the, one of my passions in hops is walking up and down rows of hops and um, just looking at the crop and smelling the crop. 
uh, much much like we did in that uh, introduction video, except uh, not quite in such formal settings. <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, it was um, it's no, I'm very proud of uh, uh, my involvement with Nectron, and as I said, it's it's a team effort that uh, I just happened to be project leader when with when Nectron was released, and uh, but I, I own the Nectron um, the weather release of nectar onto a lot of people not only growers um, but brewers who've tried it and also um, the researchers that the team that I've worked with out at plant food research so um, yeah I'm very proud of it good good um, so Dean I would like to ask you the the same question tell us the story of nectar on from a grower's perspective how does it do how do you like it um, what's your involvement in it um, yeah, well, uh, I'm quite involved, and yes, we do like it. But I'll focus on a few things. Ron, Ron touched on the um, the pilot brew plant. So I was a I was a grower on the research committee and have been for for some time. And I see that um, Eric's just asked a question about how we evaluate it. It's it's extremely difficult plant breeding. You get so many outcomes. Um, and evaluating them is really tricky. And if you try and keep too many, it gets extremely unwieldy and expensive. Um, so you do have to be quite diligent and, and quite um, accurate on, on, on evaluating and processing them. So the first sort of milestone, um, as Ron said, was when we when um, Plant and Food with New Zealand Hops had their own pilot plant on site at, at the Rewalker Research Station was a bit of a milestone because we went from having to send hops out to breweries, waiting for them to make a brew and then trying to get it evaluated with a consistent panel to being able to brew stuff on site. And my the moment, that, the sort of light bulb moment was walking into the, um, the wee lab there and seeing the list of maybe... 25 varieties that that trialed um in the last you know in the recent period and seeing um what 4337 or probably its breeder code prior to that um with a, with a triple red asterisk next to it and um sort of talking to lawrence you know what's what's this triple red asterisk and he goes wow that you know that help is wow and um you know pretty soon after that we started focusing on it and and you know trialing brews and then um, you know, we saw we we wanted to promote it. You know, we, we don't pick winners at that stage, but it definitely got um, you know got a lot of attention, and we, and we put it through. My next uh, you know touch point with it was getting it as a as a trial grower on our farm, which we're we're lucky enough to to get a small plot, and we grew um, uh, probably was it four four acres in your terms um, of hops in the, in the first year of trials and. Um, quite a tricky hop to grow as a baby hop. Um, it doesn't it doesn't grow super consistently, um, and we had quite a few plant losses from baby crop to the second year. But um, it is a beautiful hop. I mean, it looks the hop itself looks fantastic. The canopy is a beautiful color. Um, it has you know the hops all just hang sort of in consistent sizes, and and it, and it does look beautiful and. As Ron said, you know, we often he often visits or we have a lot of visitors and we walk the crop and it's always good to go to the Nectron because it looks so good. Um, so we have planted new blocks uh, where well, we've expanded our block of Nectron um, through four tranches of planting. Now we're up to nine hectares, so 22 acres, say, on our farm. So the volume is growing significantly and we still have you know we still have some difficulty raising it as a baby hop but the mature canopy is is beautiful it's a it's a pleasure to grow and when we harvest it the aromas in the picking shed are um it's really unique and the aromas are basically so so broad and so punchy you know we get aromas out of picking nectar on around the shed that you don't get from any other hop um, and as Ron said, he's been there when we're doing fresh hop, you know, hops that we're putting in a crate, going straight out to brewers. And, you know, we're, we're really proud of what's going out. It's a, it's a beautiful hop that smells great. Um, and, you know, the, the next part is, is sampling it. Um, like Ron said, you know, we, 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 it seems to have been really popular and it came, we had a lot domestically. I mean, the first release was in the, in the start of the pandemic. So we had a lot of volume went domestically and got a big uptake from New Zealand brewers. And some of the results were outstanding. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a panelist or a super taster, but, you know, we were sampling 
um, IPAs and particularly hazies with nectar on in them, and there weren't many failures. Um, so we were, yeah, I mean, you know, that's sort of our, our journey into it, and we, we think it's a great hop. We think it's got future. We get excited when we see the penetration into the market because, um, well, I'm a believer that it, that it can be a fantastic hop. Great. Sounds like sounds like everybody likes it, right? Um, well, indeed, you guys, you guys to tell us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that leads me, I guess, Dean, since we're still talking to you, how does the 2023 crop look um, in regards to, you know, what were the growing conditions like this season, how'd harvest wrapped up, um, and what should brewers expect from 2023 Necron? Um, the well, the crop. So we we wrapped up harvest uh, two, two weeks ago now, and um, the crop at at harvest time probably looked the best I've ever seen it in terms of canopy health. We had we had an amazing growing season, particularly with um, timely timely rainfall. I mean, we do often get um, rains during our growing season. You know, we're quite a green uh, temperate region. Um, and, and we do get good rains in the, in the summer, but all farms have, you know, full irrigation systems. But this year, um, two things. We, we got timely rainfall and we didn't have any big stress events. You know, our stress events are generally wind related or, or often hot, hot windy conditions from the west. Now, the, the weather patterns we've been having in New Zealand the last couple of years have have brought some real problems for some people with a lot of flooding and, and easterly winds, but for our growing season, you know, suited us well. And the the crop, the canopy from the, you know, from the outside looked the best it's ever been. We didn't have, you know, we usually have brown bits around the edges where we've had, you know, wind stress and wind penetration, but the, the crop around the district looked fantastic. Um, and that, that allowed us to harvest, um, you know, right through to the end with, with exceptional quality, I think. No one was under, you know, none of the growers were under significant pressure to get crop in as it, as it was going off, which can sometimes happen when we get stress events. But, um, you know, I, I've seen the metrics um, at NZ Hops. You know, we are continually um, advancing our, our quality control procedures and asking more and more of growers to, um, to get within our quality gates, if you like. Um, and this year, um, from what I've seen, there's been the least amount of um, penalties or outliers, um, particularly compared to, say, the last four years of, of any harvest. So I think the, the quality will be exceptional. The, the yields are not off the scale, but they are um, probably above average for the hops where growers were aiming to, to pick everything. Some of our hop varieties, um, we were aiming to be a bit more economical this year. Um, and get through them fast and, and um, not spend too much money on the the you know the very margins of the crop but the you know the varieties that we wanted everything um, yielded yielded very pleasingly not record yields but above average and I think the quality you know the consistency of the crop across all our growers and all our crop will be some of the best we've had in, in recent times. Great great brewers are always looking for consistency. Um, yeah, Ron, I mean, you can you can see in behind me, you know, that that photo. My background is a, is a spring photo with hops and um, at training time, and the you know the green landscape. Well, it, it looked like that right to the end of our harvest this year, and um, it was you know it was it was a beautiful crop this year. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, uh, Dean. It's um, to me, it, it, the, the, yeah, it's one of the few years that I've experience in hops where there hasn't been any really bad weather patterns and uh, so it was it was really good but um yeah I, I i don't know whether um la nina weather conditions are sort of going to bring out the the super best in um <laughs> in weather patterns <laughs> for new zealand um you know the tropical lows emanating out of uh, north of papua new guinea and around there is, uh, doesn't do our that's not very good for some areas of New Zealand, that's for sure. But we, we were lucky this year. We didn't uh, strike any bad weather patterns, as Dean said. They all went to the further east of New Zealand. So, you know, a temperate oceanic climate we've got, I think, is really good for growing hops. It's uh, it's pretty mild and, um, you know, we don't have great diurnal fluctuations or seasonal fluctuations, really. So we're quite lucky and we get good rains right throughout the, the, um, the year, really. Um, some years we get more than others, like in the last two years, we've had more than um, our 
average annual rainfall, but um, it hasn't been too disastrous, that's for sure. Well, it sounds like this year's crop um, is, is as good as you guys can hope for. It sounds great. I'm looking looking forward to when it gets when it gets over here. Uh, yeah, so I think it won't, you won't be disappointed. It's um, it's 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 right with the hops that I've been smelling out of the um, headquarters. You know, the the warehouse where the hops have held has been outstanding. I think you know it's really good. Perfect. Um, now I'd like to move into to how Nectaron works in the brew house. So, um, what was the what was the first commercial beer you tasted with Nectron in it? And when you evaluate Nectron, does that translate to the brew house um, one for one? Meaning, what you're smelling in the in the shed is that what is translating into uh, the beers you've had with Nectron in? Um, do you want to go first, Dean? Yeah. Um, oh, sure. I, sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm no uh, brewing expert, but um, the, fir the first beer I had with Nectaron was one from a local brewery here in, in Motueka, a small scale um, brewery, Townsend Brewery in, in Motueka, who was uh, was an award winning brewery, and he brewed the uh, Lazy Hazy um, Hazy IPA with with Nectaron, or even when it was still uh, Hawk 4337, and I, I latched on to that, and it's still probably one of my local go-tos that I showcase when we have visitors, um, you know, either either hop growers or, or other visitors, um, tourists or, or friends. Um, and, you know, my take on it is that the, you know, the the flavours we get, I was talking about flavours, you know, around the crop or in the in the, in the picking shed and in the kiln, you know, they don't directly translate the, the same flavours, but I think the the quality of flavor or the thing I think you get from Nectron Nectron IPAs and hazies is you get an amazing nose. You know, you pour it and you get the nose off the top, and it is um, it's consistently good. You know, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll have a beer and I'll, I'll taste that. You know, taste that nose and go to the can and see what it is and. Um, I think it has a superior a superior nose, um, and it and it just carries through. Like Ron said, we haven't seen many many duds. You know, I can't. Um, not not all beers are good, and you you do strike the odd bad one or bad batch. Um, I haven't had many bad Nectron beers in my time. Hmm. Okay. Oh, I want, okay, my turn. Right. Um, I guess the first commercial beer that I tasted was. Um, way back in 2015 I believe it was when it was Hort 4337 and um, Plant Food Research which is the, the company I worked for at the time um, are part of the sponsoring uh, awards at the Brewers Guild of New Zealand um, Beer Awards and one of them um, the winner of that category was a little brewery, for, this is for our particular um, sector if you like, was experimental in uh, beers and our the, the winner of our section was a little brewery in, in Rotorua of all places and uh, called Crouch's Brewing. And they um, they won our our category. And um, so what we did was we donated them some um, hops from uh, Hort 4337 and um, they did a commercial brew up there in uh, Rotorua. And, and the same reaction, they were just went, wow, you know, gosh, what's what's this hop? And, um, and so from then on, it was, it, it's sort of um, you know gradually increased in terms of you know where it went out to the different breweries. Um, probably my favourite uh, round uh, at the moment would be I, I, I do like the Townsend. Uh, uh, the the brewery is about um, a kilometre from where I am, so it's quite handy. And uh, it's um, I um, I do like the Townsend Lazy Hazy. Uh, the other one that I that was launched when. Um, Nectron was named was uh, Sprig and Fern's um, uh, Nectron um, Pale Ale. So that's another one that's, uh, it, and they've still got it on tap as well. So it's uh, uh, the Sprig and Fern chain is a, a sort of brewery uh, based here in Nelson. And, it's, um, and they've done a great job on uh, doing uh, some commercial brews with it. Uh, the, the, the head brewer there, Tracy Banner, is well known in New Zealand. Uh, she's um, one of the top. Um, Century people and it's always approached for beer judging and stuff. So uh, she's um, she's done a great job in promoting um, 
the uh, the bears. What do I get out of the the bears itself? It's um it's certainly suited to hazies. Um, and the best bears that I've tasted have got this wonderful um, tropical. I can only describe it as tropical flavors, but particularly pineapple to me anyway. That's the one that stands out for me. Um, and it's got these wonderful, rich, juicy flavors, um, in, particularly in hazies and, and also in parallels or IPAs. So, yeah, that's my experience with it. That's great. Um, so let me ask you this. The obvious choice for hazies and IPAs, um, what unexpected beer style have you seen Nectron used in and have you tasted it? And, and just what other than the IPAs have you seen Nectron used in? Um, well, for me, I'll answer that first, Dean, if you don't mind. And I, one thing that I've, um, I've experienced recently, it's, it's actually an IPA, but it's a, a zero alcohol um, beer it's in the zero category. And uh, there's a brewery here in New Zealand called State of Play. And this guy's 100% um, zero um, alcohol beer producer, if you like. And uh, he's got a stand to uh, a, a, a beer there, which he uses 100% nectar on. In. And uh, I, I think it's um, it's an unusual, um, you know, the zero beers are um, unusual to taste anyway. But the, the nectar on is actually uh, enhances it quite nicely. It's uh, got, because it's so big in flavor itself, um, so that would be the one that stands out to me. I haven't really tasted too many other styles. I think it's pretty, pretty young in terms of hop development. Um, so, um, I, I can't really, you know, it's been used in Pilsners and other beers, but, um, I, that would want be the one that stood out for me as a category, if you like, you know, the zero beers. Yeah, the zero beers are starting to become a, a larger and larger category even here in the United States. So that, that's that's good to know. How about you, Dean? Uh, yeah, well, we're pretty similar, really. Like, um, I don't think I've had um, a pilsner with nectar on this this summer. I mean, we do we do drink pilsners and sometimes lagers here when the weather's hot and we're working or boating or something like that. Um, but I haven't I haven't seen one that Nectron stands out. But like Ron, I agree the zero. So uh, I've had two zeros with with Nectron now in the state of play. Um, you know, without without punching anyone's product too much. The um, the when I first poured the the Nectron zero, um, the nose was sensational. The nose would match any, anything normal. I mean, you know, it's really hard to get the body of the beer to match. A, you know, a five or six percent hazy, but the 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 initial nose was a hundred percent hazy, and the body was you know probably one of the best zeros I've had. So, um, and and talking to the guys there, you know, saying that they you know they did a lot of lot of research, and Nectron was one hop that could really hold that hold that flavor in a zero, unlike anything else. So, um, yeah, endorsing Ron's Ron's notes there about that. That's good to hear. Um, I think brewers are looking for something to to really enhance their non-alcoholic beers, and it sounds like Nectron's a, a good choice for that. Um, well, that's great. Um, what's coming next for New Zealand Hop? Um, I know there's there's breeding on the way, but Dr. Ron, what what uh, what can you say is is coming out here relatively shortly, if not out already? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, we've got um, the relationship we've got um, between plant and food research and uh, New Zealand hops, the, the cooperative, the grower cooperative, is um, as we've highlighted, is it's a long-standing relationship we've had, and it's been formalised in 2020, and we've got a joint breeding program now. Up until that stage, you know, we used to get support. When I say we, I mean plant and food research. We used to get support from the um, the um, the government in terms of um, applying for basic science research and things. So we've had a lot of focus, as you can appreciate, on flavour and aroma in, in that program. And I guess the, um, yeah, we, you know, we've going forward, I think um, we've got some really, really promising selections that have come through the that area. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the genetics of our program and um, 
we've got this thing the pathway to market really is is the key to any plant breeding program be it hops or whatever crop and um so there's a there can be a a natural attrition if you if you get to advanced selection stage and you haven't got a good pathway to market uh, via a, a commercial entity like uh, um, NZ Hops, things can fall off, fall off the cliff, so to speak. And um, so what we've what we've developed at uh, NZ Hops is this uh, program called the Brack Brewing Program, which uh, I see there was a question which I answered. Um, uh, just a few minutes ago about um, how, how do we get involved in um, in this program. Um, so we've got this, this program is basically taking a really promising advanced selections that have come through the agronomics, they've come through the um, all the attributes that you want in a hop in terms of its chemistry testing uh, right through to its flavor and aroma and, and beers. It's been tested um, and it's, it's ready to go out to brewers. And this program, uh, the Brack Brewing program, is is what we've uh, developed in the last two years. And so um, <clears throat> Nectaron would probably be the forerunner to that. It was really that went through the system really a little bit before. It was sort of unofficial Brack Brewing program, if you like. And um, but now we've got this pathway um, to market with these selections, and uh, we've got um, quite a few. We've got eleven selections in this um, pathway. And some are ready to go out to brewers and some are not. And we've got uh, this coming season, we've got four selections, which we believe have got attributes that are worthy of doing commercial brews with. We've had them tested on grower properties and we've got a significant amount of production there. We're pelleting them at the moment. And so they're going out to brewers in the next two or three months. The We've chosen... Um, brewers from uh, US, Australia and New Zealand and and also reaching out to the UK now um, just to look at breweries that have actually been positive about using New Zealand hops and also um, uh, in particular ones from the cooperative. Um, so, you know, we, we're highlighting um, those breweries and sort of approaching them and we, you know, we have a contract with them. They have to supply information back to uh, New Zealand hops and feedback into the program, you know, whether what they like about the hops and or what they don't like about the hops. So it's a, there's an attrition rate, of course. You know, you can't have, um, as I said, there's eleven selections, but uh, you know, I don't believe that um, they're all going to be commercial. So it's it's one of those. Um, I think it's a, it's it's a great example. I don't think I can't think of anything any other breeding program in the world that's got this. Um, with hops formally like we've got uh, where you push it out to um, a, a wide selection of breweries. We're getting good feedback from across the ditch in Australia and uh, the, the New Zealand hops are quite popular over there. Um, and likewise in the US, um, I'm going, as as we've alluded to, you know, I'm going to be up at the CBC uh, in Nashville in a month's time. And uh, after that tour, I'm going to be spending some time with several breweries doing collab beers, um, not with the um, Brack Brewing program, but also just pushing our cultivars out to um, you know, the new ones are not that well known in the US, I believe. So um, trying to do recipes that might be of interest to North American brewers. So yeah, that's, I guess there is some new ones coming out. There's uh, one called Superdelic, which has been released, of course, um, a month or so ago. And um, there's other ones, some really promising ones coming in behind there, which we're really excited about. But at the moment, we can't say much about them because they're under plant variety rights protection. It, um, we're just going through the process, so we can't sort of shout it from the rooftops just yet. But super delicate we can. And so we, we have done that. That's, that hop is amazing. It's, um, it's got such different flavors than what um, uh, Necron has got. It's sort of much... I would say more on the sweet berry, you know, those flavors. So we think it's got a, a great future in combination with other hop cultivars, not necessarily ones from New Zealand, but certainly with other cultivars, it's going to enhance the flavors of some really outstanding beers. So we're very excited about it. Great. Uh, of the ones that you are working on now, are they all slated for aroma qualities or are there any higher alpha designed for the kettle um or is it all or are we all just sticking a roman flavor um we we don't emphasize or we've certainly got some high alpha types but we don't um usually 
most of our hop selections are now around the between I guess nine and twelve percent alphas, so I wouldn't consider them high. Um, but we're trying to emphasise you know high oil content in our hops, and uh, trying to get that um, flavour into the into. You know, I think the important thing is is that we've uh, Matt has we've got to be seen to be different than anywhere else in the world. We, I mean, there's not much point us trying to outdo America or Germany in terms of. <laughs> Um, you know, the hop styles that they produce, which, you know, you know, there's nothing wrong with their, their styles. It's just that we want to be different. And uh, I think that's that's the pathway we want to emphasise going forward. Um, and, you know, it certainly has been in the past. We've had this catchphrase of hops with a difference. And it's, um, I believe our hops are different. We've, our genetics have been, while they've come from overseas, it's been 180 years in the making. Uh, and the hops have been in in um, around since the 1840s as Dean alluded to so um, we've got material here which we've uh, developed if you like and um, selected and used as parents in our breeding program and I believe that we've um, got some you know some flavors that which it would enhance the uh, the world's hop um, and beer community in terms of um, positive attributes anyway so uh, you know they I believe that New Zealand hops and American hops combine very well together. For instance, um, they they go well. They've um, the American hops in general are sort of um, what we call more piney and woody flavours to them. Uh, ours are more juicy and uh, fruity. So I think that the two go quite well together. Um, it's interesting, you know. I've I've um, I'm hoping to write a book about um, hops hop production and or hops in general in New Zealand the history of hops and uh, so I've got a co-author who's who actually knows how to write books with me <laughs> so he's he's going to help us with it and uh, he's um, he's a beer writer actually so he's uh, he's done quite a lot of uh, writing uh, but I, I've sort of got the knowledge if you like in terms of the history of the hops and um, one thing that's sort of I've been really interested in is is the pathway that we've got um, in terms of our genetics and it's it does seem to be different um a lot of our material uh, has revolved around old english cultivars and also um north american semi wild and wild cultivars so it's um it's it's rather interesting um you know to to going forward i think we've um you yeah, know we haven't really emphasized um, to answer your question we haven't really emphasized uh, high office but we've certainly as flavor is the is the big thing that we gunning for if you like and uh, I think we've got a good system we're using the the pilot brewing plant as a toolkit it's not you know we we're not we're not turning out the world's best um beer from the uh pale it's just a, a standard pale ale recipe with the uh, malts dialed down and uh we've got moderate bittering going into the the this pale ale and we and we dry hop with these with our selection. So that's our procedure. I think that's one of the key points with our program is that we've, um, I guess we've been independent. Good, and I agree with you. I think New Zealand hops blend very well with a lot of the um, varieties that, that are here in the in the US. Um, I've, I've done it myself, so yes, absolutely. Well, it's great to know. Um, so Dean, you've been too quiet, so I gotta ask you a question. Um, speaking of difference, uh, can you talk about the New Zealand U.S. growing differences. How, how is growing in New Zealand different from maybe the Pacific Northwest or farming or anything techniques that you you may employ that that are not employed in in uh, the the United States? Yeah, well, um, the first thing is, I guess, to to talk about our region. So the we're at the top of the South Island. The the Tasman region is a region that is. Um, where our economic activity is largely primary produce. Um, so we have a quite a significant fishing port here. We have a lot of um, horticulture in pretty much our, what we, our fertile river valleys. So the alluvial river valleys that are quite sheltered um, from the winds have, have good groundwater for irrigation and alluvial sort of recent fertile soils. So, um, the region is is known for all, all ranges of horticulture, um, some some wine growing, although it's probably a bit temperate for that. Um, but there's there's vegetable production and there's significant apple and kiwi fruit production. Um, the the hot regions are near the coast, but also in the less temperate 
parts further inland where you can't grow you can't grow say kiwi fruit because of the frost pressure you can grow hops so a lot of the um, recent developments have been on ex-dairy farmland where you've got significant flat fertile areas with access to water um, in, in sheltered areas so I guess um, for someone from North America you would say we're more well, and I haven't been there, but I'm going. I'm going soon. But what I understand is it's more Oregon than than Washington. It's a lot greener. It, it's quite a temperate environment. Um, it's not, uh, yeah, more temperate than than the US growing regions where you know we're surrounded by water, so we don't have the extremes of temperature in the summer or the winter. Um, we do. Uh, where my farm is, we're 50 kilometers or is that 20, 26 miles inland, so we do get significant winter chill from our frosts. Um, and the growing differences, well, the biggest the biggest difference, I guess, at a farm level um, is that we're smaller farms. You know, we, we don't have the scale of North American farms. All our farms in the New Zealand Hops Group are, are um, shareholder suppliers. So they are generally farmed by the families that own them. Um, and being smaller, I think you get, you know, so on my farm where we're 64 hectares or about 160 acres, so that would be very small in North American terms. Um, I, um, my family owns the farm and I, um, I run it. We've only got a team of, say, seven full-time employees, but with significant seasonal labour. So, um, you know, I guess my message to, to people that are buying our hops is that I am there nearly every day. Um, ensuring you know and pretty passionate and excited and invested in the the growing process and the harvesting process so um, you know we 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 know what we're doing we've learned from you know from our group of master growers within our group they're really happy to share knowledge and um, you know my take on it is that the you know the collabs that craft brewers do nowadays are a commercial opportunity but particularly a learning and experience opportunity to you know go to your mate across town brew with him learn from him chat to him chew the fat have a couple of beers you know put out a product that's exciting for the market well we we do the same thing you know the growers love visiting each other's farms talking about what they're doing learning and we think through that sort of collaboration over a long period we've got some really good practices and some really good knowledge within our group so yeah, smaller farms, but very diligent and quite accurate and with a big attention to detail. Um, some of the sort of, um, um, you know, process differences are that we, um, well, the main one is that, as Ron alluded to, we don't have touch wood many pests and diseases. That's, um, you know, another thing about tyranny of distance being a long way from anywhere. Um, we're lucky that we, we don't have significant pests and diseases. The one major pest we do have is the two spotted uh, mite and we um, on my farm I haven't used a canopy spray for eight years um, we we do all our pest management through um, our IPM integrated pest management which is release of predator mites that we purchase and distribute we do a lot of scouting and measuring where the pressures are and, and distributing the predators to to take on the bad guys um, we use overhead irrigation a lot. Um, you know, drip irrigation is more common in, in the US and we do have some of that here, but we use overhead sprinklers um, because one, we can get the irrigation on, but it also provides moisture for our for our canopy to aid in our IPM strategy. The, the predator bugs that we release thrive and have a better life cycle in, in moist and humid um, situations and the the two spotted mite loves the hot dry conditions. So by increasing the humidity and the moisture levels in the canopy, we are slowing down the bad guys and aiding the good guys in in their fight. So um, our other differences, my farm we actually have some organic land. So we have um, fifteen percent is um, certified organic through our domestic program and, and certified internationally through iFoam. So we we've learned. A lot of practices through growing organics that we now apply around the farm um, and one of those is, is so we, we nearly all farmers here would use sheep as a significant uh, weed management tool um, we graze sheep all through the off season in our hops um, and then again once the binds are 
you know, our Christmas. So you're, you know, sort of mid uh, early July period, once the bonds are sort of, you know, past the three quarter way up the up the trellis, we we introduce sheep, which basically defoliate the bottom, say meter, three, four feet, possibly four feet of the bond, defoliate that, you know, de-sucker it, um, eat the weeds. So that reduces our need for herbicides and also aids, you know, harvest um, for harvesting and hooking binds. Um, so yeah, sheep is a really common site and, um, you know, also introducing, um, you know, a bit of biology into, into the soil um, and aiding our, aiding our hot nutrition. Um, other differences, yeah, so, so no canopy sprays. Um, some growers would use canopy sprays as a, as a last resort to for two spot and mite only, but other than that, no, you know, no fungicide sprays and, you know, a very small percentage of pesticide sprays. Um, as far as harvesting, you know, smaller farms, smaller facilities, but we have, you know, um, common North American harvesting facilities, a lot of Dan Howe pickers. Um, as far as kilning, um, my my farm uses bed kilns, which is the North American style. Um, we we use um, we converted recently three years ago from coal fuel to wood pellet fuel. So we use a wood pellet that's produced about twenty kilometers from the farm for fuel. So we knocked out um, a massive chunk, more than fifty percent of our farm side greenhouse gases to fuel our kilns. Um, we have bed kilns where we use a, a boiler. Well, all, all kilns in New Zealand use um, clean air that are going through the hop. So they all have heat exchangers, generally hot water heat exchangers. So we have a boiler to heat the water, blow the air through a heat exchanger, and there's clean air going through the hops. Um, so we use bed kilns, but there are quite a few on the smaller farms, German-style tipping kilns where you have multiple levels tipping through. And some of those are made here in New Zealand and some are imported wolf machinery. So a mixture of, you know, European style machinery and American style machinery. Um, I might be rattling on here a bit much, but, the, you know, that's to, that's to give an overview of, of the differences here. Um, yeah, come, come and have a look sometime. You're welcome on our farms. We had a lot of visitors this year. Um, if anyone's interested, come on down next harvest. Great. Thank you, Dean. Um... So we're, we're running up on time here. I want to thank you guys uh, for attend uh, for attending this this webinar. I do have a question for you, Dean, and the question and answer. Um, I know Dr. Ron has answered uh, any questions um, in the chat, but there is one question for you, Dean. Um, just curious, what harvest moisture level do you get the most nectar on nectar on flavor profile out of? Like seventy two um, to seventy eight percent. We yeah we, we generally we generally look at twenty four percent dryness. What's that seventy seventy six percent? Um, one thing about nectron is that um, this year particularly, which we noticed now now we've got significant acreage and different levels, is that it seems to hold really well. Um, we harvested um, our baby crop and our mature binds probably eight days apart and um, yeah I mean the, the sweet spot for moisture levels um, yeah I mean we probably haven't got a handle on that yet but one thing we do know is that the crop sort of sits in the ripe zone for a, for a decent amount of time to allow a good harvest for, compared to Nelson Sovin for instance Nelson Sovin um, would be a lot earlier and would be a lot greener so you would we would start harvesting nelson sovereign at a lower dry matter um, percentage uh, nectar on we think we can wait for the dry matters to get up higher and the crop will hold really well um, as we harvest it so yeah we're generally targeting 24 percent dry matter or 76 percent moisture um one one more point. I mean, I guess it's of interest to 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 BSG and all you North American customers. Um, one, you know, uh, Ron talked a little bit about our BRAC program and our research program and getting stuff out there. Um, you know, we are a we are a small supplier here in New Zealand. New Zealand hops is, is a small supplier, and you know, a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, the pointy end stuff is probably quite hard for you to get hold of. Um, we've been cognizant of other releases not getting enough volume. Um, so with Nectar on, we've taken significant, you know, quite a leap for us in, um, in supply. And we've ensured that 
you know, growers have invested in, in new volumes. So our volume this year is, um, you know, almost three times our volume last year. So where we saw significant demand, you know, we've reacted to that. And I'd like to, you know, say to you guys, if you, you know, had trouble getting nectar on last year or couldn't get it because it was too expensive, which is probably demand driven, um, you know, reach out to, to the BSG guys. We think we've got significant volumes available to go up there. And hopefully this year we've got enough to make, you know, plenty of plenty of beer for you guys. So yeah, don't don't be shy. We've got a lot more than we had last year. <laughs> That's great, Dean. Thank you. Um, again, I want to thank Dr. Ron Beetson and Dean Palmer for joining us today. Please come by the BSG booth at this year's CBC in Nashville. It's booth number 409. Dr. Ron will be joining me and a couple hop farmers from the US uh, during our Hop Expert Roundtable uh, starting at 12 noon on Monday, May 8th. So if you'd like to talk to Dr. Ron himself, please come by the booth and have a beer and let's talk nectar on with him. Um, Dean, thank you so much for, for all your insight and your information on, on farming and Dr. Ron, uh, we can't wait to have more beers uh, with nectar on in it. Um, and thank you both for, for showing up today. Um, if you have any questions about Nectron or want to order, please um, contact your local BST sales rep uh, and reach out um, because we uh, will have it ready for everybody uh, as soon as they want it. Um, and again, thank you uh, so much for joining us today. Oh, that's it's a pleasure. Um, you know, thanks for inviting us, and you know, it's great to be part of this sort of um, rollout of. Uh, talking about New Zealand hops is something that Dean and I love to do anyway. So, um, and I look forward to being in Nashville with you guys uh, uh, next month. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Thank you. No problems. Okay. All, All right. Best. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, everybody have a good rest of your day. Okay. You too. Okay. Cheers. Alrighty. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.